All right, hi everyone. I hope you guys are doing well. So in this video, we are going to finish the slides for chapter three, talking about different models of abnormality. We will discuss activity three in this video. So I'll give you the topic there. Remember that I'm looking for your original work and I'm looking for a response that is at least 200 words long. As always, if you have questions, let me know. Also, after you watch this video, you will have all the information that you need for exam one. So exam one is going to be multiple choice, true, false, and matching. I've done a couple of things to help you prepare. One is that I've posted a practice exam. The practice exams are worth just a couple of points of extra credit altogether, but there's four of those, so that'll be worth eight points by the end of the semester. You don't have to complete them. They cannot hurt your grade in any way if you skip them, or if you take them and don't do well on them, it won't hurt your grade, it's just extra credit. The main point of the practice exams is to help you study. So you can see what sorts of questions might be on the exam. Those questions will be very similar to exam questions. Also, I'm gonna be posting a review video for you as well. There is a study guide on Canvas, and so the review video will just be me talking through the high points of the study guide. So if you have questions after watching this video and watching the review video, please let me know. Otherwise, we're gonna go ahead and get into lecture. All right, so during our last lecture video, we talked about a biological model. So during this lecture video, we're gonna talk about some other potential models that are more psychogenic. So we're gonna be thinking about some psychological causes of disruptive, dysfunctional, distressful behaviors. So we're gonna start off talking about the psychodynamic model. Now, what you need to know is that the psychodynamic model was originally um, associated with Sigmund Freud. And so he was the first, uh, really the pioneer of the psychodynamic model. You may also hear the term psychoanalytic referring to this model as well. So psychodynamic, psychoanalytic, pretty much interchangeable terms there. Freud was one of the uh, first uh, to be thinking about psychological issues in this way. Uh, however, there have been um, a great number of researchers who have come after Freud. Um, they may be referred to as neo-Freudians, but people who have come after Freud um, not all of which who have completely agreed with Freud's viewpoints. Um, theories of personality is a fantastic class to think about if you're uh, interested in, in what some other Freudian uh, thinkers, you know, post-Freudian thinkers had to say about the psychodynamic model. But the psychodynamic model is the oldest and probably the most famous psychological model, which does not necessarily mean that it's well understood but it's one that people have probably heard about. So when you take general psychology and you get flooded with information, probably the thing you walk away from is you remember something about Freud. Maybe because the name is familiar, maybe because his theories were um, a little bit distinctive. We'll go with distinctive. So the psychodynamic model is based on a belief that a person's behavior, which could be normal behavior or abnormal behavior, remembering the difficulty uh, and differentiating between the two of those. But normal or abnormal is determined largely by underlying forces. Now it says that these forces are dynamic, which means that they interact with each other and that they are constantly in a state of change. They interact with each other and the forces may not be in our conscious awareness. So we're gonna talk specifically about three uh, of what Freud would describe as these forces that we may not be aware of, but that are impacting our psychological experiences, impacting our behaviors, impacting our ways of thinking. So Freud would say that psychological problems come up when our three forces are not playing nicely with each other, basically. They, they get out of balance. So before we can talk about that, though, we have to define these three forces. So the id, the ego, and you'll see on the next slide, the superego. So basically, Freud thought of your personality as something kind of like an iceberg. With an iceberg, there's a portion that you can see that's above the surface. And then there is a much larger portion underneath the surface that is still there, that is still an important part of the integrity of the iceberg, but that you cannot see. And so with your personality, Freud would say, there, there are certain aspects of who you are that you're aware of. 
but there are so many aspects of your personality that you are not aware of. So according to Freud, the id would be the first component of your personality to develop. So Freud would say that babies and very young children already have an id, although they would not yet have an ego or a super ego, but the id would develop first. And that the id is the part of the personality that is guided by the pleasure principle, which means that the id wants what it wants and it doesn't care how it's going to get it. Now, you can think about this in very young children. If you've spent time around babies and toddlers, when a baby or a toddler wants something, they let you know they want something. They cry, they scream, um, they, depending on the level of development there, may try to communicate and tell you what it is that they want. But basically, babies are not going to give up until they get what they want. They're going to continue to express their uh, displeasure. So Freud would say that the id is the part of the personality that is completely willing to do whatever it takes to get what it wants and that the id is made up of instinctual needs, drives, and impulses. So Freud's theory has been criticized in part because of the emphasis on sexuality. And so sexuality, sexual functioning was a very large part of Freud's theory. Well, Freud would say that the id is basically wanting to get whatever it wants to get. Well, Freud would say that what the id really wants is to have sexual pleasure uh, and also aggression. Aggression is another thing that's a part of Freud's um, theory as well. So the id is that selfish part of your personality that's only interested in pleasing itself. Next up, an ego starts to develop at a certain point. Now, the ego is going to be the realistic component of your personality. So it's going to be guided by the reality principle. Basically, what the id is going to do is it's going to try to balance out, or what the ego is going to try to do is it's going to try to balance out the id and the superego, which we're going to talk about in a second. The ego is the executive that's in control that's trying to balance out the other two. So the ego is aware that the id has needs, but the ego is also aware that you have to follow the rules, right? So the ego is going to seek to get the gratification that the id wants, but it's going to try to find appropriate ways to do that. So, for example, if the id wants something, the id is going to take it. Well, the ego is going to say, well, we can't steal that. How can we get it in a way that's fair? How can we get it in a way that is appropriate? So the ego is going to try to meet the needs of both the id and the superego in a realistic way. Now, the ego, according to Freud, has what we call defense mechanisms. Now, defense mechanisms basically are ways that your ego kind of tricks you a little bit to try to reduce psychological problems. So you've probably heard some of these terms, things like denial, things like repression. Well, you're just repressing that memory or you're denying the truth that's right in front of you. Um, or there, there's, there's a whole list of defense mechanisms. You can see sometimes with kids, uh, if they've gone through some kind of stress, they kind of like regress back to an earlier stage of development. All of that, Freud would say, is a defense mechanism. It is your mind's way of trying to prevent you from feeling psychological distress, trying to handle conflict. So the ego is the executive. It's the one that's in control. The id is the screaming toddler. Now, the last of the three forces to develop, according to Freud, would be the superego. The superego is guided by a morality principle. Basically what happens is you develop a conscience at some point. Now, where does your morality come from? Oftentimes we would say it comes from your parents, and to a large extent that is true. Your parents teach you right from wrong, but your parents are not the only ones who teach you right from wrong. You may have other relevant adults in your life, grandparents, aunts and uncles, teachers, um, maybe society at large. So our culture plays a role in our morality, where you grew up, what kind of peers you spend time around. So you develop this morality, and this is the last of the three to develop. So. The superego is very hyper aware of doing what is right. So while the id is screaming, I want what I want and I don't care who I have to hurt to get it, the superego is screaming, you can't hurt anyone, that's wrong, don't do that. So the ego is right in between these two and is trying to find a way to satisfy the superego so that we feel like we are morally good, 
but also satisfy the id and get us the things that we want in life. Now, in a healthy personality, these three would work together. I mean, you understand that we would need all three of these, right? If a person had no super ego, they would have no sense of morality, they would be a serial killer, right? We're going to talk about antisocial personality disorder later. But what if a person had no id? What if there was a person who was only ever worried about pleasing other people and without a, an id, a strong id component, that person would never get what he or she needs and would always be stepped on, uh, which we could talk about dependent personality disorder. So in a healthy personality, these three work together and the ego is able to balance and manage the super ego and the id, perhaps using defense mechanisms to do so. However, if the id, ego, and super ego are in conflict, this may be where we start to experience psychological problems. So imagine a person whose super ego is too strong. This person's sense of morality is excessive. Um, this could be obsessive compulsive personality disorder. We're going to talk about, we'll have a lecture on personality disorders later. But a person who is obsessed with being perfect and never upsetting anyone. That's going to cause some psychological problems. On the other hand, as I said, if the id gets out of control, then we start hurting other people, we start having aggressive issues, that kind of thing. So we can have psychological problems, according to Freud, when our unconscious forces are not playing nicely with each other. Now, as I said, psychodynamic could be interchanged with the term uh, psychoanalytic. So there are several different ways of looking at psychodynamic and psychoanalytic theory today. So not everyone who would classify their, him or herself as being psychodynamic follows Freudian theory exactly. Uh, some of the things that are in common among people who would claim to have this kind of model, uh, they seek to uncover past trauma and inner conflicts. We already talked about the inner conflicts a little bit, uh, about having parts of your personality that kind of underneath the surface where you really can't see them are fighting and causing problems. But the uncovering past trauma is another interesting bit. So part of this may have come from who Freud worked with. So Freud primarily worked with uh, well-to-do women who were coming to him with symptoms uh, that we'll talk about later in our somatic lecture, but symptoms that at the time were called hysteria. Basically women, many of them having physical symptoms that didn't seem to have a physical cause. And so perhaps because of his very specific group of people that he worked with, and um, there is an emphasis in a psychodynamic model of past trauma. So the childhood is an especially important time according to this theory. And uh, a child who experienced some kind of trauma, according to Freud, would likely not be able to handle that, wouldn't understand how to process that, and so some of those defense mechanisms might kick in, things like, for example, repressing that experience, maybe so we don't even remember it at all. So psychodynamic theory is going to focus on past trauma, inner conflicts. The therapist would be viewed as a subtle guide to kind of help the individual start to see what's going on beneath the surface and to try to bring those unconscious conflicts to a resolution. Now. When you note here, it talks about the therapist being a subtle, a subtle guide. A subtle guide, um, which may be fantastic, may be exactly what some people need, uh, but this kind of therapy is something that's going to take a long time. It's not usually a short-term kind of therapy. Although, I mean, there may be some forms of psychodynamic therapy that are shorter than others. So what kinds of actual techniques are used in a psychodynamic or psychoanalytic uh, setting. Several, um, more than we could talk about in the scope of this class. We will talk about psychodynamic theory some when we talk later about specific disorders and different theories about what could cause those. But a few ideas. First of all, free association. Um, it seems like the majority of depictions of psychologists on television tend to be a little more Freudian, tend to be a little more psychodynamic, and maybe that's just because that's really what Hollywood thinks of when they think of psychologists. Not all psychologists use these, but free association, basically the idea that you may have this denial, you may have this wall up where your ego is trying to prevent you from thinking about certain things or feeling certain things, 
But if you just let a person talk long enough, eventually that ego, that, that wall that's trying to protect you will eventually kind of soften a little bit and some of those things that are hurting you will show through. So free association, basically just having people talking, just letting them continue to talk until they say something that seems to maybe give you some idea of what's going on beneath the surface. Also, um, psychodynamic therapists would be huge on interpretation. So when you're talking about interpretation, you're suggesting that the psychologist is the expert and that the client comes with their problems and the psychologist interprets things and figures this out and then informs the client of what's going on. There are other models that would say that the client is um, the expert on his or her own experience but a psychodynamic therapist would take more of the expert role here. So for example, when it talks about resistance, resistance refers to a person refusing to discuss a certain, maybe certain situation or a certain person or just having a hard time. They always change the subject. They don't seem comfortable. So you start asking the client questions about their mother and the client is either just refusing to talk about their mother or they change the subject every time mom comes up. And the psychologist would say, hmm, it seems to me that your ego is trying to resist this conversation about your mother. It's trying to repress something about your mother. Um, transference would be another example where interpretation might happen. So transference happens if a client starts behaving towards their psychologist as if they were a certain other significant person in their life. So for example, if a female client is seeing a male psychologist and she has issues with her father, then the idea of transference here is that because your father is seen as a male authority figure, then a woman might, or even a man in therapy, might transfer some of his or her feelings, uh, the aggression or whatever it is that they feel towards their dad onto the psychologist and then the psychologist would interpret that like I think that's interesting uh, maybe you you start assuming that the psychologist is going to treat you the way your father treats you or is going to think about you the way your father thinks about you and the psychologist can catch that and interpret that to help you see issues that you might have with your father dream interpretation is another thing that you see primarily with psychodynamic models so the idea behind dream interpretation is that your dream includes both manifest content and latent content. So the client will be the one to provide the manifest content and then the clinician would interpret and give the latent content. So basically the manifest content is the actual content of the dream. So if you were to say, I had this crazy dream last night where I was in my underwear back in high school and it was a test and I forgot to take it and whatever, that's the manifest content. That's what actually happened in your dream and you as the person who had that dream would be the only one who could provide that. But the psychologist would then turn around and interpret that by providing the latent content. This is what's really going on underneath the surface. This is what's really causing a problem for you. now. I understand that there are many different schools of thought on dream interpretation and that some individuals would hold to this more strongly than others. What I will say about dream interpretation is that it is very low in reliability. In other words, if you give the same dream to 10 different people and ask them to interpret it, you'll probably get 10 different interpretations. So it's not necessarily something that is very reliable in our research. Um, I actually did an activity like this when I taught in-person general psychology in the past where I would make up a dream and then ask the students to try to interpret it. I got a lot of really interesting responses, but I had very few responses that actually were anywhere in the same ballpark with each other. So not very reliable there. All right. So psychodynamic was one of the first models to come out and so it was a vastly different way of thinking from some of the more biological um, thinking maybe the differences in your humors or we talked about maybe syphilis gave us the idea that perhaps there's a biological infection that's causing psychological problems so this is a major shift in thinking so a lot of individuals didn't like the idea behind a psychodynamic model. 
for a few reasons. Perhaps because it's very hard to do any research with a psychodynamic model. So if you have a client come in and the psychologist says, huh, that's interesting, your symptoms seem to line up with a person who was traumatized. And then the client says, no, I've, I've never been abused, I've never been traumatized. And the psychologist says, ah, oh, yes, well, you have, you just don't know it because you've repressed it. You see, it's very hard to do research on something when the answer is often, well, you've just repressed it or you're just denying that, you're not aware of it. So it's very tricky to do research on a psychodynamic um, kind of viewpoint. And also, the fact that the psychologist is the one interpreting everything kind of takes away from the client being the expert on his or her own experience. So some individuals didn't like also Freud's theories I, I, we touched briefly, uh, very heavy into sexual content. Um, Oedipus complex, Electra complex, the idea that little boys uh, are suppressing a desire to sleep with their mothers, little girls are suppressing a desire to sleep with their fathers. It's, it's kind of um, controversial, to say the least. So the behavioral model kind of developed in response to the psychodynamic model. Uh, like the psychodynamic theorists, the behaviorists also believe that our action is largely determined by our experience. So psychodynamic theorists would say early childhood is huge and any kind of trauma or issues during early childhood create problems later on. You can see that there's an emphasis on the environment. Behaviorism is going to be very strongly, uh, going to strongly place an emphasis on the environment, but it's going to take a different approach. According to the behavioral model, your environment is important because of the principles of learning. So we are going to very briefly touch on a few of the basic ideas behind behavior modification or behaviorism or the principles of learning. But basically the idea that, for example, the reinforcement and the punishment and the modeling that you have received in your life from your parents and other authority figures has greatly shaped who you are. So, these models began in laboratories, which I should say is also an argument against the behavioral model. Some individuals feel like it's a little bit too cold and calculating. Um, the behavioral model, a lot of this research was done on animals, dogs and mice and cats, and so uh, although a lot of it does apply to humans, um, some individuals are a little bit offended by it. So if the behavioral model assumes that the problem is you've been reinforced for unhealthy behaviors or you've been punished for bad behaviors, it kind of takes out of the spotlight what are you thinking and what are you feeling and it kind of reduces the person to you are what you do and very few people like that, like being told that you are what you do. We all have bad days when we do things that we're not proud of and we don't like to be told that whoever I was on my worst day is who I really am inside. But there are going to be good things and bad things about every single model that we talk about. Uh, so we're going to be talking briefly about operant conditioning, which is going to refer to the reinforcement and the punishment. Uh, modeling, which is about watching someone else and learning from that. And then classical conditioning is about learning associations. So if you've heard about Pavlov and the bell and the dogs, then that's what that's referring to. If you haven't heard about that, hang on just a second and we'll get there. Any and all of these can produce normal or abnormal behavior or a combination thereof. So the therapist is going to try to identify what behaviors are not working well for you and try to change those. Now, it seems strange perhaps to think of disorders and, and psychological disorders as boiling down to your behaviors, but they often do. When I say depression, we usually think of the emotional component of depression, but there's certainly a behavioral component. So people who are depressed don't do things that they enjoy anymore. They don't want to get out of bed. They don't feel like interacting with other people. You can see how your behaviors, like not spending time around people, uh, not going to work, not paying the bills, that kind of thing, could then create emotional distress. So the behavioral model is going to seek to change the emotions and the thought processes by changing the behavior. So first of all, briefly, just to scratch the surface on operant conditioning, and there's so much good stuff here, but 
Operant conditioning is about reinforcement and punishment. So humans and animals learn to behave a certain way as a result of rewards or punishments. So for example, as a parent, you want to reinforce their kid, your kids for doing their chores, for eating their food, for uh, going to sleep when you tell them to go to sleep, whatever the case may be. And you want to punish your kids for doing behaviors that are dangerous or behaviors that are disrespectful, right? So the idea is that without even thinking about it, we're using operant conditioning all the time. Not just with parents and kids, but with spouses or with boyfriends and girlfriends, with friends, with peers, with coworkers. You're always reinforcing and punishing people. Okay, so how does this apply to clinical psychology? Well, what if, for example, a person has anxiety and they find a way that makes them feel better? and reducing that anxiety is reinforcing for them. That's rewarding for them. But what if the behavior they choose to help reduce their anxiety is not a healthy behavior? What if they start using a substance to reduce their anxiety? Well, having your anxiety taken away is reinforcing. It's rewarding to lose something that you don't want. But unfortunately, now you've been reinforced for a behavior that might be dangerous. On the other hand, you could see how a person could be punished for doing a good behavior. What happens if a person is engaging in perfectly normal social behavior, but for whatever reason they're ignored, they're not given attention for that, basically they're punished for socializing with another person. You could see how that person could go on to be very anxious in social situations because they've been punished for behaving in social situations. So operant conditioning is the idea that any behavior you reinforce or reward will happen more often. And any behavior you punish will happen less often, or you'll decrease the probability of it happening. We'll talk more specifically about this as we go along and talk about different disorders. Modeling it says individuals learn responses by observing and repeating behaviors. Now, who do you model? You don't model everyone you see. There are so many different people doing so many different things. There would be no way for us to model everyone. Typically, you look for the most relevant models in your life and maybe the most successful models in your life. So when it comes to relevant models, you would think a child would probably model their parents, maybe especially their same-sex parent, little girl models mom, little boy models dad, because that's a relevant model in their life. Uh, could also model um, you know, teachers, grandparents, other relevant people in your life. Now, we also tend to model people that we respect or people that we think of as successful. So I want to turn out like you, therefore I want to do what you do. Um, so you can think about high school. There's a lot of modeling that goes on, a lot of trying to be like the popular kids, trying to be like whatever, wear the same clothes that the famous people are wearing, that kind of thing. But we really do learn a lot of what we know from watching other people. And then classical conditioning, finally, is usually the one that's a little bit harder to understand, but it's basically just learning an association. It talks about learning by temporal association, which has to do with time. Basically, if two events occur close together in time, we learn that association. And sometimes it only takes once. And sometimes it's something that we have to have those, that association or that pairing many times before we learn it. But let me give you guys an example. Uh, food poisoning is an example of one where I don't know if you guys have experienced food poisoning or God forbid if you've experienced food poisoning while pregnant. Let me assure you that is one of the most unpleasant experiences of a person's life. But what happens is imagine that there's this new food that you've never eaten before or a food that you feel neutral about, a food that you don't really, you don't really care about, but you eat that food. Okay. And then at the same time or very shortly after you develop food poisoning. Okay. Now, food poisoning naturally causes a reaction, right? And if you haven't experienced it, I'm so glad. Um, there's, there's a natural bodily reaction to food poisoning. But what happens is because the food poisoning happened at the same time or around the same time that you ate the other food, you learn an association between the food you ate and food poisoning. And before long, just the thought of the food you ate will make you sick. You've learned that association between the two. And now that food that was originally neutral has now become conditioned to make you sick so that even the thought of that particular kind of food is problematic for you.
probably the best known uh, example of classical conditioning comes from Pavlov. Um, and so this is the experiment with the dogs. So Pavlov was doing research with dogs and part of that research was of course feeding the dogs. But he discovered something interesting and so this is, this is the way that it worked. The, the food that they presented to the dogs was an unconditioned stimulus okay, that produced an unconditioned response of salivating. In other words, the food naturally caused the dogs to drool, salivate, drool, right? The food naturally caused the dogs to drool. But what they found is that if they were to ring a bell every time they presented the food, ring the bell, give the food, ring the bell, give the food, over time, the dog would learn the association between the bell ringing and the food being presented. And before long, hearing a bell ringing was enough to make the dog drool, or enough to make the dog salivate. Why? Because the dog learned an association in the same time period, right around the same time, learned an association between a bell ringing and the food. So now when the bell rings, the dog's mouth starts to drool and he starts thinking, okay, I'm gonna get food now, right? Now, this sounds like an idea that we can understand, but maybe not one that we would think would apply to abnormal psychology. Well, it is. Um, there are several different applications of classical conditioning. We'll talk about one in just a second, but we'll have some more come up throughout the semester. Now, the therapy that comes along with a behavioral model is going to try to identify problem behaviors and replace them with more functional behaviors. Now, you can use classical conditioning, operant conditioning, modeling, or combination thereof. So you may use modeling at first where the psychologist demonstrates the appropriate behavior and then once the client starts modeling it then you reinforce or reward that behavior so you bring in some operant conditioning. You can definitely use a combination. And there is a form of behavioral therapy to treat just about all of the disorders we're going to be talking about this semester. So. In this situation, the therapist is considered a teacher. Basically, I'm educating you on ways to change your behavior. And so the client would come to the therapist to learn appropriate ways of handling this problem behavior, fixing it. So not so much a healer, not so much I'm trying to cure you of your problem, and certainly not an underlying unconscious conflict. So with behaviorism, it's going to be very different. It's going to be very much focused on what's happening right now and focusing on the behavior that's right in front of us, not the unconscious processes as much. So classical conditioning in particular has been used to treat phobias. We're going to talk later about this more. A phobia is just when a person has an extreme fear, anxiety response to a particular situation that's not appropriate. I mean, if it's appropriate, it's not a phobia. But if it's inappropriate and it's causing you dysfunction, could be a phobia. So basically, the idea here, the behavioral viewpoint is that you came across a scary situation. And when you come into a scary situation, it's natural for you to be afraid, right? Just like it's natural for the dog food to cause the dog to salivate, being attacked, for example, being attacked by a dog would be an unconditioned stimulus that causes an unconditioned response of fear and anxiety. That's perfectly normal. But according to this behavioral theory, what happens is you learn the association between the dog and the attack and you think to yourself now, all dogs are going to attack me. So you've developed a phobia through classical conditioning. We want to treat it using classical conditioning. So instead of having the association be, okay, I see a dog and so I'm going to panic. Now we want to teach you, I see the dog, so I'm going to relax. So the first thing you do before you do anything else is you teach the client relaxation skills. So breathing, muscle relaxation, that kind of thing. Then you make a list of all the different situations where a client might be afraid. So this is your fear hierarchy. So you'd be afraid petting a dog. That may be at the very top of your hierarchy. But even other things like uh, seeing a dog through a window could cause some anxiety in someone who has a phobia with dogs. Um, even looking at a picture of a dog in a book. So what you would do is you would create a list of situations that cause anxiety, rank them from the ones that only cause a little bit of anxiety all the way to the ones that cause the most anxiety. And then once you have done this and you've learned your relaxation, we're going to actually confront those feared situations 
starting with the easiest ones. So if the easiest one is looking at a picture of a dog, then I'll put up a picture of a dog and I'll have you practice your breathing and your muscle relaxation until you're calm and until you can look at a picture of a dog without being afraid. And then from that, we'll go to the next step, which might be watching a dog out a window. And so you're afraid, so we're gonna practice our relaxation, our breathing until you calm down and so on and so forth until we get to the top of that hierarchy, which would probably be actually playing and interacting with a dog. So that's just an example of how your uh, classical conditioning could be used to treat a psychological problem. There are others that we can discuss later. Now, the psychodynamic model says the problem comes from unconscious conflicts. The behavioral model says the problem is because you're doing behaviors that are dysfunctional and not helpful and need to be replaced with appropriate behaviors. The cognitive model is kind of a response to the behavioral model. The, the behavioral model is very much you are what you do. And although a behaviorist would probably acknowledge, yes, people have thoughts and feelings, they would not emphasize those thoughts and feelings as much as they would emphasize behavior. So a cognitive model here would suggest, okay, instead of focusing so much on what a person is doing, let's focus on how a person thinks about themselves, about the environment, about the future, and that perhaps instead of your thought processes coming from your behaviors, maybe your behaviors are coming from your thought processes. Maybe the way you see the world is what leads you to behave a certain way not that behaving a certain way impacts the way you see the world. So, this model proposes that we best understand abnormal psychology by looking at cognitive processes, which when we're talking about cognitive, we're talking about things like your thoughts, things like your attitudes, things like your attributions, which we'll talk more about later. So, instead of trying to challenge and change your behaviors, the cognitive psychologist, which the or the I should say, there's a difference there. The clinical psychologist who has a cognitive model uh, would try to focus on your thought processes. Cognitive psychologist is something a little different. Someone who studies mental processes without necessarily focusing on abnormal psychology. But there are clinical psychologists who want to treat psychological problems who have a cognitive viewpoint that those problems come from your attitudes and your thought processes. So just a few basic examples here. Uh, your abnormal functioning, the dysfunction in your life, your distress can come from several different cognitive problems and this is just a few of them listed here. Uh, faulty assumptions and attitudes so sometimes people tend to jump to conclusions for example. You make an assumption uh, based on very little information and that assumption is not always accurate but you stick with it because no one likes to be told they're wrong and once we start thinking a certain way it's hard for us to realize that maybe we're not thinking in the correct way so you make assumptions you have attitudes maybe you have a very pessimistic attitude maybe you have a very negative attitude towards yourself maybe you have low self-esteem maybe you have a very you know hopeless attitude towards the future maybe you have some thought processes that are what we would call illogical. There are many different thought processes that could fall in this category. It gives the example of overgeneralization. So, I mean, overgeneralization happens when something bad happens in one area and you assume it will happen everywhere else. So this is the idea, well, I failed that one test, so I'm gonna fail out of college. Or this one person wouldn't go out with me, so no one's gonna wanna go out with me. So you take one particular situation especially in this case a negative hurtful situation and you kind of blow it out of proportion and expect every situation in the future will go the same way. So people who have depression in particular tend to have some thought processes that are not helpful uh, or not really functional at all. So what we're going to try to do according to a cognitive theory is to change the way people think and um, Beck is probably the name that's most closely associated with cognitive therapy. The whole idea behind Beck's cognitive therapy is to first of all help clients see the thought processes that are not logical and then replace them with more logical thoughts. That's two separate processes. If you don't convince the client that their way of thinking is wrong, they'll never really want to change it. So you have to show them that their way of thinking is illogical. Now this is a little tricky 
As you can imagine, some clients don't like this. Some clients don't like having the psychologist say that's inaccurate. So you want to build a, a lot of rapport with a client. In other words, you want the client to trust you and like you um, before you start telling the client that they're wrong about something. But for example, what happens if you have a client who has anxiety, who is afraid of getting sick? And so the client is like, I can't go visit a friend in the hospital because I'm going to get sick and die. The psychologist might say, well, that's not the most logical way of thinking. Have you ever known someone who went to visit at the hospital and didn't get sick? And the client says, yes, I, I have known that. Okay, have you ever gone to the hospital and visited someone and not gotten sick? And the client might say, well, yeah, I, I have. And so then the psychologist might say, well, I'm wondering how true that is for you then. And the client's like, hmm. Basically, you start presenting some evidence to suggest that their way of thinking is not necessarily accurate. We call this hypothesis testing. So in research, a hypothesis is an idea that we haven't proven or disproven yet. We're still looking for information against it. So when your client presents um, a, a way of thought that you don't think is accurate, instead of flat out telling them they're wrong, you can say, well, let's treat that like a hypothesis and test it. Do we have any evidence that suggests that everyone in your life hates you? And they might have some evidence, but I'm sure there's also some evidence against that, right? So having this hypothesis testing attitude can be more helpful than just directly telling them, no, you're wrong, directly confrontational with them. Now, this is used primarily in treating depression. Most of the research on cognitive therapy has to do with depression um, because depression does uh, largely involve negative thoughts about oneself or about the future or about you know kind of several different life situations however it would make sense that cognitive therapy could be a helpful component with several different disorders um, if someone has an eating disorder then that person probably has some um, what we would consider to be inaccurate ways of thinking about food or ways of thinking about what your body should look like and so some cognitive components could be helpful there as well it's just another example uh, humanistic theory and therapy uh, is basically associated with Carl Rogers, although there are others um, that could be associated with it as well. The basic idea behind humanistic theory is that we are good people, that humans are good. But the problem is sometimes things get in the way of us self-actualizing, which would be the term they would use. Uh, it talks here about self-actualization. Self-actualization is kind of that um, reaching the peak of your own existence, fulfilling your own potential, be the best you that you can be. And according to Rogers, we all set off down a path to self-actualize. The problem is that very few people actually make it to self-actualization, according to Rogers. And that's because there are some basic things that you need in order to become a self-actualized person, in order to reach your full potential. And sometimes we don't get those things that we need from our environment. So. For one thing, Roger says that everyone needs unconditional positive regard. In other words, you need the people in your life to care about you unconditionally and to think good of you unconditionally, right? A child needs their parents to love them and be proud of them and care for them even if they screw up, like unconditional positive regard. According to Rogers, if you have unconditional positive regard from the people in your life, you'll start to have unconditional self-regard where, okay, everybody in my life loves me no matter what, so I can love myself no matter what. But according to Rogers, if the people in your life put conditions of worth on you, then you'll never be able to self-actualize. Conditions of worth refers to the idea of, I only love you when you do this. So as long as you make this kind of grade, as long as you make this kind of money, as long as you don't say something that hurts my feelings, I'll love you. But with a condition of worth, I'm saying, I will stop loving you as soon as you stop doing this good behavior. So Rogers would say, you can't self-actualize with that. You trying to earn someone else's love is an incredibly stressful thing for a person and is not good for a person, basically, which I would agree is, is true. So Rogers formed what he called client-centered therapy. So and this is one where the client would be excessively his or her own expert. So 
Rogers client centered therapist would not take a, an advice giving role at all. Like, you're not going to give advice. You're not going to tell your client what to do. You're going to assume that your client knows what to do. Your client is a good person trying to become their best self. So all you have to do is give them what they need to get there, which is a supportive climate. So Rogers would say, if the psychologist provides unconditional positive regard, which sounds a little bit strange, it's not necessarily love, like you think of love, but I think good of you regardless. Even if you tell me some hurtful things, even if you've had some bad experiences, I think good of you regardless. Um, empathy, being able to show that you can understand their feelings, and being genuine and sincere with your client if you can provide a supportive climate that includes those things, then Rogers would say that would help your client become more self-actualized, would help your client get back on that path towards self-actualization. Now, this sounds really good. Uh, there's very little research support, per se, for this as a standalone treatment. It's one of those things like when we talked about the the people in the asylums trying to help. We need good food and we need clean clothes. Yes, you do. You do need those things, but that's not necessarily enough. Uh, you need unconditional positive regard. You need empathy. You need someone who's genuine. That's not necessarily enough. Having said that, though, almost every psychologist would say that they include some of this in their own style. So although this is not necessarily viewed as a standalone treatment by many, we will include aspects of this humanistic therapy in any other kind of therapy to help our client feel uh, cared about, feel like someone is hearing them. It's all about developing a relationship with the client. All right, those are some of the major models. We're gonna touch briefly on a couple other ideas before we finish up today's lecture. So a sociocultural model, just like it sounds, is gonna argue that abnormal behavior is best understood in light of the social and cultural forces. So your experience is not something that is set apart from what's around you. Your experience is embedded in several different layers of culture. So you'll have the people closest to you, your family and your friends that you interact with on a daily basis. And then it'll kind of go out from there but you'll still have layer upon layer of your social influences. So the media, for example, is a social influence that impacts you. The neighborhood you live in, uh, perhaps the government is, is also an aspect of your culture that impacts you. The time period you live in. So living in this year at this time gives you a very different experience from people who lived 100 years ago. So addressing the norms and roles in society right now to try to help us understand where problems come from and try to help them. So if, for example, a person is um, living in poverty, then you have to think about that. It's not just about checking off boxes about this symptom and this symptom and this symptom. Uh, it could be that the, the problems are coming from stress that comes from living in an unsafe neighborhood or that comes from living uh, in poverty, not sure how you're gonna pay the bills. So a sociocultural model would be one that would not just think about the boxes you check off in the DSM, but also to be thinking about the different layers of influence that are impacting you right now. Which one of those layers would obviously be your family and the people closest to you. So there has been a movement towards including other relevant people in treatment. So not just having one-on-one -on -one treatment, but having other relevant people, which could include family therapy, uh, so if a, if a husband is having problems, we could bring in a spouse, we can bring in children, we could maybe even bring in like the parents, like whatever relevant people you have in your life. Now, they can help you by holding you accountable. If we're doing a behavioral treatment, they can help provide that reinforcement and punishment uh, outside of the therapist's office. So the therapist only sees you, what, once a week for 50 minutes, but your family is with you all the time. Uh, couples therapy. Uh, not just for people who are actively distressed, but for people who want to prevent distress from coming up. Couples therapy is fantastic. Uh, group therapy might not actually involve people that you were close to before the treatment started, but having a social support network of people who have the same experience as you. So you've probably heard of some of this. Um, 
like different substance use groups. So people who have an alcohol problem might meet with other people who have alcohol problems. Uh, or a person who is grieving, a person who has had some kind of trauma might benefit from having a group therapy setting where they're um, very aware that they're not alone, that there are other people who've had similar experiences. Maybe even working with a community at large. So if you see that there's a community that's struggling with substance use, struggling with crime, struggling with uh, maybe uh, maybe there's been a string of like suicide attempts, that kind of thing. Um, having a community working together for, with an emphasis towards better mental health for everyone. Obviously, these are great things, but also things that do require resources, money, right? Now, these are some of the major models, and most psychologists would say that they're kind of eclectic, that they really focus on more than one model at a time. Um, and sometimes we use what we call a biopsychosocial model or a biopsychosocial theory, which basically includes the biological components, uh, your genetics, your neurotransmitters, your um, nervous system development. But what also includes psychological influences, right? So maybe things like trauma that you've experienced, stress that you're going through, that kind of thing combined with, well, what kind of parenting did you receive? What kinds of peers do you spend time around? So it's trying to see the entire person, see the entire picture, not just look at a person on paper as this is a person who has depression, but trying to get a full view of this person's existence, which can be helpful because sometimes if we have a narrow-minded approach and we treat the biological component without helping with the psychological and social components, we'll only have limited effect. We have to understand that a person has both a biological predisposition and a social condition that they're implanted in, as well as psychological experiences. So trying to focus on all three at once is a lot of information, but really helpful. So. I love this. This is one of my favorite things here. Biopsychosocial theorists might refer to a diathesis stress model, which I absolutely concur with. The diathesis stress model suggests that a person has a predisposition towards a certain psychological problem, and then the stress comes and triggers that problem. So follow with me here. A person might have a biological predisposition towards developing schizophrenia. But if that person has a supportive environment and they never go through any significant trauma and life is good for them, they might actually never start to develop those symptoms because they weren't put under the stress that caused that predisposition to become a problem. On the other hand, there may be a person who does not have a biological predisposition towards schizophrenia, but they're put under extreme stress but they never actually develop schizophrenia because they don't have the biological predisposition. Even though the stress was there, they didn't have the predisposition to trigger. So what happens is you have the predisposition that you get, which we often think of as being biological, but could be psychological or social predisposition. And then there's a trigger. There's a stress there that causes that to start being symptomatic. So this can help us understand why sometimes a person who has a genetic, maybe they have, their many, many, many members of their family have bipolar disorder, but they don't have bipolar disorder. Why? Maybe this helps us understand. Or a person who's been traumatized many times, but does not develop PTSD. Maybe this helps us to understand why. So the diathesis stress model is a really helpful way of thinking about this. Oftentimes people are gonna say, I'm eclectic. If you ask a psychologist, what is your viewpoint, what's your model, they might say, well, I'm eclectic. Uh, I'm primarily cognitive, but I include behavioral and maybe a little humanism too. So there are some people who would say, I am strictly psychodynamic, I am strictly sociocultural, but most people would say they're a little bit of several different models. All right, this leads us to activity three. So activity three asks you to think about the models that we've talked about. So we talked about psychodynamic, we talked about behavioral, we talked about cognitive, we talked about humanistic. Um, you can speak to the sociocultural if you would like. Um, but choose the model that most appeals to you. Describe that model so that I understand, I know you understand it, 
and then explain why you like it. So if you choose behavioral, for example, give me a basic description of what it means to have a behavioral viewpoint of abnormal psychology, and then tell me what it is that you think is accurate about that, what it is that you like about that. So that's activity three. So refer back to the uh, introduction about the due dates and times for that. Also, that's the end of today's lecture video, but also don't forget about exam one. I'm going to be posting a review video where I talk about the study guide, but please let me know if you have any questions as you prepare for that, and I will talk to you guys after exam one.